Well, hello everyone and welcome to our seminar, As You Go, The Great Commission for Ordinary People. My name's Tim, I'm based in Nottingham in the UK and I work for LICC and I'm joined by my friend Annie. Hi Annie. Hi Tim. And Annie is in Bulgaria. In Sofia, yes. Sofia, exactly, <laughs> yes, which is probably the nicest place in Bulgaria. Is that fair? Not at all. <laughs> it's it's pretty nice yeah okay We're okay <laughs> pretty nice good glad to hear it so um what do you need to know for this networking seminar well as annie and i talked about this and thought about what we wanted to share something that became quite apparent was that we are experts in being ordinary people and so we don't want to share what we think are the answers we just want to share something of our stories and what we're learning in the places that we've been amongst the people that God has put us over these past years. And what we hope is that by giving you a chance to listen to our stories, there might be some resonance with your own stories and we might together figure out what God is asking of us in this next season as we think about as you go making disciples as ordinary people. So that by way of introduction, I'm going to hand over to Annie, who is going to tell us some of her story. Over to you, Annie. Thank you, Tim. I did try to come up with a great story, compelling story to tell, and the experts will advise you that a great story starts with this inciting incident and leads to rising action and climax, and then you have your satisfying resolution. <laughs> but life's not that way, at least not for me. And it is a string of many, many days, mundane events, cooking, small talk, and kids needing stuff so I expect God to act and rightly so but um, I think that I expect that when he does act he will kind of exchange the ordinary for extraordinary or with extraordinary and in reality I have found that it's in this ordinary that Jesus moves and he does draw people to himself and advancing the gospel, his gospel, until we eventually reach that resolution in eternity. <clears throat> so I don't know, but probably I guess it's in this everyday stuff that um, God's love is expressed through us. And it, it does move from being just a, a spiritual idea to, to become a gift to, to others. So um, I think that to begin with, I, I need to share a little bit of my own journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've been a believer since 2005 and somewhat involved with the Ministry of the Navigators over the years and actually became staff um, in 2013. And honestly, I've never felt comfortable talking about God and faith with my secular friends, nor with my family. So um, when I hit rock bottom in 2018, I had just joined this group of young, brilliant people from other countries, the future leaders of the ministry in Europe. And I, I just got completely overwhelmed by burnout, depression, anxiety. And I believed with my whole heart that I don't have any faith in God anymore and that I'm a complete fake in my job and I, I may cry now but um, for a long time I, I had grown to believe that if I did all the right things spiritually I would grow and this is what I thought others as well and I think what it did to me was just killed my relationship with God or whatever that was but it was through my subtle belief in a gospel of works that I didn't even understand. And I struggled for almost two years <clears throat> because I didn't want to have anything to do with, with Christian work anymore, but I also did not know where to find meaning. Uh, and guess what? That it, exactly at that moment when I was completely free uh, of a fate, I would say, I was also completely free to share my faith or the lack of it with my, with my neighbor, the one I go jogging with regularly. And um, 
she was not too interested in, in the spiritual, but she was interested in me. And that just amazed me because I've always thought I need to share. And now I find myself without <laughs> any faith to share. And there we go. Um, I started talking with her about my struggles, how I struggle with work, what a fiery torment it is to even attempt to have hope. And I also shared that I really truly want to know God, but I just can't. So she had compassion with me and I, I really felt free for the first time because I, I just had let go of my Christian worker self and I didn't care at all to evangelize her. So um, right around that time, God had mercy on me and some people, wiser people pushed me to take a very long sabbatical. And with the help of a very, very precious person who became my friend uh, and was willing to walk with me through my darkness and help me open up all these hidden parts of my heart. This is why I'm here today. And this friend discipled me in a very different way, not forcing me to believe in the, the cliches that we, we are so used to hearing, but she encouraged me to ask the real questions and to explore the depth of my fears. And um, she also ex helped me explore the, the truths of the gospel and what they meant. Um, there was no telling me to practice more in the spiritual disciplines, uh, but always practicing with me, praying and pointing towards Christ and, and his truth. So slowly, a process of healing had begun in me, and um, it really solidified my belief that we always need others on our journey, no matter where we are along the way. So um, during that time, one of the most liberating truths, I believe it's true, I read in a book about the meaning of the Sabbath, was this that um, you have to understand that the world has already been created and it will survive even without the help of man. It, it sounded common sense, right? Um, but I wondered, do we really believe it? Or we are running everywhere as, as if everything depends on us. So especially in ministry, we, we engage in the exact opposite sometimes devising our programs and techniques and schemes and strategies as if God needs us to promote him. And uh, so in my personal life and ministry, at least, it, I finally found the freedom. I was convicted that evangelism is all God's work because he's the one who draws people to himself, like the gospel of John teaches us in um, that it says that the father tells us everything about himself and he draws us to him. So for me, the most central part of the strategy became to really know Christ and to really walk with him. And now today I actually have the desire that others will experience his present presence and, and this same freedom that I am experiencing that he gave me. So I'm thinking that if I walk with him, then he walks with everybody else that I walk with, right? Um, it, it does make sense to me. Uh, so it, there is this, this book I enjoy reviewing every once in a while. It's called Down to Earth Discipling. And the author says there that um, if you are a kingdom laborer, then you have to be up to your neck in people. And, I found this description really good, where we should be. So this is what I, I try to do. I just make myself available to people. I am there as much as possible present. And um, now I actually sense God's presence when I am with others. And so many conversations have happened in the past year that I have not had for the previous 15 um so for example one of my best friends and 
that we've been together with since we were seven. She's secular, um, like kind of nominal Orthodox Christian, but um, of the secular kind. And she gave birth to a baby waiting for 10 years um, to have the baby. And uh, I was with her while she was pregnant during these lockdowns. And when she was not going out, when the only person she would see would be her husband most of the time. And uh, I was available for her on the phone. And um, I made a point of visiting her and I still do that every two to three weeks. I run errands, I consult her, um, being a voluntary lactation counselor. And um, I do that for several other friends in town who have small kids or babies. I bring food in jars on the subway and I hold the babies while mothers run to the pharmacy. And one day this friend of mine asked me that same best friend of mine asked me why I am always available and letting people take advantage of my, my help. And uh, right then I was able to tell her that this is God's love for her and for others. And it is expressed through me. Um, and um, it, it just reminded me of, of John 15, where it says there is no greater love and to give your life for your friends. And we often imagine that this in some heroic terms, I, I would take a bullet for my friend. But in my life right now, it means I would take the bus to my friend's house across town. And um, it also meant that confessing to her that I do this also because of my desire to be exceptional and amazing. And I honestly exposed my struggle with pride, but also my prayer that um, there will be more of God and less of me as time goes. And uh, she heard that she still does not engage in, in spiritual talk, but uh, we are friends. And um, all this means I babysit a lot for my neighbors who work full time. Um, that one I, I run with, she uh, works full, full time. She comes home, complains that they will have toast for supper again. And I bring her bowls of soup sometimes, not because I'm so great, but I have compassion on her because I work from home and I understand her, her stress. Uh, so I have really sensed the calling to be very local and to focus on what's right here in front of me. Um, not only because I literally don't leave the neighborhood sometimes for days in a row and work here. Um, so with this neighbor friend, uh, there are many things that connect us, of course, kids, food, but also the need to escape. So we run a few times a week. 30, 40 minutes, and while we run, we always talk about everything. We talk over each other, always something to complain about, something to share, and this has really blossomed into a, a great friendship. We just spend time together, and uh, when we have problems, there is no way we won't share. It's It's been a journey with her, just ongoing, normal, every day, and she was there to witness my pain and suffering when uh, I did suffer, but also she did um, see my healing and recovery and, and my new hope and how, how God became real to me. So I am able to witness how she wrestles with her story. And I, I do have an opportunity to and permission to offer my questions sometimes that might lead to alternative answers. And on my part, I know how to specifically uh, pray for her and how God may become real to this specific personal story. Uh, so as, as we go, we, we've had a lot of conversations about, about God and faith, just like that. Uh, one, one funny story is, may not be so funny, but it was funny to me because there is, we have this holiday 
in Bulgaria celebrating the creation of the Cyrillic alphabet. And um, I have a little kid's Bible that I like in, in our house. So I, it's probably the first um, openly cliche Christian thing I did. I went and gave this little Bible to her kids, telling them that the alphabet in Bulgaria was created so that people can read this book in our own language. And um, right now, my friend tells me they take this book everywhere with them. They call it their religious book. And believe it or not, while we run so many times, she brings up uh, topics from the Bible just because she was reading at night with the kids, this funny little uh, version of the Bible. And we've talked about God's commandments and the people God uses and who is open to the spirit and adultery and whatnot. And I think once God freed me from this burden to evangelize, I stopped feeling the pressure to, to manipulate conversations towards Christ. And many of those conversations became about Christ. So one of the, the saddest days in these past months was when this friend of mine and her family moved out of the building and out of the neighborhood. So I kind of lost a friend and it's, it's, it feels like, God, it's not over yet. I have more work to do with her, but I know that it's his work. It's not mine. And I just keep praying that I find ways and make time to see her and to to witness how God will pursue her and how Jesus might become real to her but um yeah there is somebody who is staying it's the other neighbor Christina she's the mother of a four-year-old who just never leaves her sight and she has fears she's bound to her house taking care of this perfectly healthy boy just because she's broken in some way that I don't know but she's fearful and so I sometimes invite her to my house during the day when I'm here and they play in the other room uh, I work in my room and it gives them some variety but we do have some conversation and she knows that I see her and that I care for her and hopefully someday it will lead to some prayer and some discovery and possibly her freedom in Christ. Um, and just, we just have so many little stories like this that um, sometimes I forget to notice, but they are here. But we are all on that, on that way to Damascus. Um, and I think before we get blinded or other people who don't know God get blinded by this light of Christ and before they accept this gift that he gives, um, they can have a chance to see him in our lives, in the lives of, of the believers. And this is discipleship, whether they know it or not. Um, and um, if we let them in our lives, not just try to get into their lives to help them, that um, opens up a whole new level of relationship so we we've had to learn that so uh, i i am really inspired by by jesus's words to his disciples after he encounters that samaritan woman at the well and later he tells them open your eyes and look at the fields they are ripe for harvest so we immerse ourselves up to our necks in the harvest in people um, and to me this it's the start uh, of, of something really beautiful and I just like to ask everyone uh, if if you opened your eyes who would be there and um, Tim I would turn it over to you now thanks honey and thank you for sharing such a beautiful story on so many levels. I was writing things down the whole way through that I thought were very powerful and profound. And yeah, as I tell some of my story, I'll, I'll try and um, emphasize the bits that I think resonate with what you've shared as well. My context that I find myself in um, is a band and in particular a death metal band. So from left to right, 
that's obviously me. I play guitar. Then Ed, who plays drums. Andy sings. Chris plays guitar also. And then Andrew plays bass. And I joined the band about 15 years ago, back in university days, when I was a coming to, coming to the end of my first year, I think. So a first year student. And they needed a guitarist to fill in for them for a show. And I, I said I'd fill in. And then I ended up staying around. And I think... I joined with a bit of excitement, not only to be in a band and play the kind of music that I wanted to play, but also because I thought, hey, here is a cross-cultural mission field, me getting out of my um, kind of Christian bubble and all the subculture that comes with that, uh, and into this, this ethnos, this people group. So I was reflecting on the Great Commission and Jesus says, make disciples of all nations, of all ethnos, of all people groups. Um, the death metal, culture metal culture is definitely an ethnos and um, it's probably an ethnos for whom christianity and the bible are not viable options for anything the question for me though was how can i make disciples in this context and um showing up here how can i be proactive in in sharing my faith and yeah living out the great commission so 15 years later um we're on album number two and a half we are a signed band we've toured but no one in the band would call himself a christian other than me and in some ways i feel vulnerable talking about it because it's something that is precious to me and i think when you talk about something that's precious to you you maybe feel a bit vulnerable because you don't know what other people are going to think and also vulnerable in the sense that on one level i have nothing to show for 15 years of being in this band with these guys. That's not an ordinary um, context <laughs> that you are describing. <laughs> no, it's true. It's not an ordinary context, but um, I think it's relevant to this discussion because um, it's a place where I found myself. And when you look at the Great Commission, the active verb is make disciples. The passive part of it is as you go. This is just where I was. It was as I went. Oh, I found myself in a death metal band. And um, Annie, in your story, you shared about all the places you were and the people that were just there. So anyway, all of that is just a caveat to say, no, I'm not an ordinary person in that sense, but this is quite an ordinary thing to do just to be where I am. So what fruit have I seen? I've seen God working in me and through me, I think. And actually, I have thought many times over the years that although I thought I was joining the band to be good news for them, they've been good news for me in some ways, getting me out of my echo chamber. They don't see me as a Christian professional who knows all the right answers. Whereas in some of the circles that I move in, that's what I am seen as. And it's so good for me, so healthy to be seen by them in that way, because that's probably more what I'm actually like. And they have nicknames for me like Selfish Tim, which helps me reflect <laughs> on how I come across to them. And yet on the other hand, I get glimpses every now and again of what they are actually seeing in me. And maybe they call me selfish, Tim, because they see that I'm selfish and maybe they try and wind me up. But I remember one conversation with Andrew, the bass player, and I can't remember how we got onto the topic, but we were at the pub, beers in hand, and he said, look, there's no way I could believe what you believe, but I can see that what you believe makes you a miles better person. And that's a really good thing. There's an element of serving one another that's good a kind of interdependence whether that's ferrying gear to and from venues or sharing lifts or doing video editing or music editing all of that shows up and there's friendship of course there's deep friendship I think particularly for guys in this context the band gives us a reason to hang out together and the friendship is really the best thing about it at the end of the day we've all said many times I don't really mind if anyone ever listens to the music and <laughs> just creating it and playing and being together is, is what this is about. And that's why we do it. And then every now and again, um, as I kind of mentioned, a crack will appear in the aggressive superficiality of the band. And it makes me think, oh, these people are real people made in the image of God who are dealing with things. And so I think about a time when we were on tour and we were chatting away in the van it's not very glamorous. If you're thinking big tour bus, you need to think small, <laughs> converted van, uh, sweaty men in it, driving up and down the motorway in the UK. And somehow we got on to talking about family 
and our families and someone said yeah families they're all a bit messed up aren't they and then there was just a moment where no one said anything and it was heavy it was a heavy moment it felt like well we've touched on something here that matters to people and then the conversation moved on but I got a glimpse of something there um, that was profound and I think about a book that I really like um, written by a missionary to Kenya uh, it, the book's called Christianity Rediscovered and he talks about how doing evangelism is stepping into the sacred arena of people's lives and that's a helpful thing for me to remember people's lives are sacred their stories are sacred and um, I dishonor them if I if I don't take time to hear that or create a space in which they can share that and I can share my own story um, I think a lot of what I've been learning and this is fruit in me as much as through me is much like you said Annie letting go of my own agenda a lot of the time and that was a lot of what I came in with in terms of my own agenda about how I was going to be the best thing ever for this band. So partly that shows up in letting go of some of the songwriting process and my perfect, brilliant ideas, letting them be reshaped by the band. But it's also that that's a little picture of a kind of more broad sense of showing up with with more of a generosity um, than, than a tight hold on things needing to be the way that I want them to be, especially in that missional sense i think ultimately what it's added up to over the years is an expression of what i think saint john of the cross said evangelism is which is the patient work of putting love where love is not that's what i tried to do can you tell us more about how how have your questions changed where are you living with now or over the past 15 years yeah first thing is this tension between being present, deliberately present to people while not wanting to be passive. And I spoke earlier about how I feel a bit vulnerable talking about the band and that I don't have anything to show for it. No one has become a Christian. And I have to ask myself, well, could I be doing more in some way? I don't know. But on the other hand, I think presence is at the heart of the gospel, Emmanuel. And I think about mm -hmm. Acts 17, where Paul says that God did all this so that people might reach out to him, seek him and perhaps find him, though mm. he is not far from any one of us. And that sense of God not being far is a very helpful, liberating thought. And again, I think Annie, it chimes with what you said about God's at work here, um, whether I'm there or not. Um, and yeah presence is important another thing that's come up for me is to realize that an expression of faith in any sense from these guys might be a long long way away and yet Jesus is still the fulfillment of their highest aspirations and their deepest longings so a meaningful response to the gospel isn't necessarily a verbal proclamation of anything it's a move towards Jesus and move closer towards those true aspirations and those true longings that my bandmates and I have. And, and, and maybe making disciples is moving towards Christ together. But that question rings in my ears as well that I just mentioned. What is a meaningful opportunity for these guys to respond to the gospel? We met when we were students. They would go nowhere near an evangelistic event on campus. So okay, I need to rethink about what movement towards the gospel looks like and what a meaningful opportunity for them to respond to Jesus actually is, whether they know they're responding or not. And then my last thing would be, as I've already mentioned, it, it feels vulnerable talking about it. But I also wonder if actually lots of Christians feel like this and about the contexts that they are in. And lots of us don't have flashy stories that are going to be told at the front of our churches or at missions conferences. But the patient work of just showing up does matter. Um, and uh, if we can affirm and encourage one another in those places um, and take a kind of long gospel view of things, then maybe more will happen.